everyone. It's great to be with you again. Today I'm going to read you the story of David and the building of the temple. Now David was a great man, a man after God's own heart, but he wasn't a perfect man. The Lord God said to him, you will shepherd my people of Israel and you will rule over them. They anointed David king over Israel, just as the Lord had announced through Samuel the prophet. It took several years for David to gain peace in the land, but by the time that David sat upon the throne, the nation was at its height in size and strength, and God gave peace in the land, despite David's sins. Now David had been concerned that the worship of the Lord had centred in the tabernacle, a tent-like structure that was originally built by Moses. David himself had built permanent homes for himself and his family, and he felt it was unfitting for the worship of God to be in such a tent. So he called Nathan the prophet and he said to him, See now, I live in a house built of cedar wood, but the ark of God lives within curtains in a tent. Nathan responded by saying, Go, do all that is in thy heart, for God is with you. But later that night, the Lord corrected Nathan, reminding him that he had never asked for a house to be built of cedar. And God instructed Nathan to pass that message to David. And God's message was, It is Solomon, David's son, who shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. I will establish his kingdom forever, if he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my laws. I will make Solomon a great king. His enemies will not do well, but his kingdom will flourish and prosper. I will satisfy your land with food for all those who are poor, and I will bless her priests and the people will sing and shout for joy. David may not have had time to build the temple anyway because it took many decades to gather all the materials and the skilled workers needed to build it. Now the temple of God is often called Solomon's temple, but it's really the temple of God because it wasn't built for Solomon, it was built for God. And Solomon only helped to build it and David supplied the means to do so. And David told the people of Israel why he couldn't build it. And he told them, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And I made preparations for the building. But God said to me, you may not build a house in my name for you are a man of war and you have shed blood. Now David said, Solomon my son is young and inexperienced and the house that is to be built for the Lord needs to be exceedingly magnificent of fame and glory throughout all the lands. I will therefore make preparation for it. So David provided materials in great quantity before his death. And while God allowed David to pursue his passion of building a temple by making the plans and preparing, he was wrong to, uh, David was wrong to doubt his own son's ability to accomplish this because the wisdom of God had been granted to Solomon to have the ability to build the temple. So King David said to his son Solomon, be confident and determined, start the work and don't let anything stop you. The Lord God whom I serve will also be with you. He will not abandon you but he will stay with you until you finish the work to be done on his temple. The priests and the Levites have been assigned roles to perform in the temple and workers with every kind of skill are eager to help you and all the people and their leaders are at your command. Now, if you remember in the book of Genesis, um, uh, God helped Noah create an ark or build an ark and an ark was a a boat wasn't it and it contained all the animals and Noah helped save those animals from the flood but God gave Moses instructions to build a different type of ark and this was an ornate or a fancy box designed to hold some of the laws of God and God had given these laws to the Israelites to be in charge of 
and the laws are called the Ten Commandments. And the box was also a marker of where the presence of God would rest and where God would talk to his people. So the Ark of the Covenant was a different kind of religious symbol than the Israelites were used to. It wasn't a statue meant to represent what God looked like, and nor was it a container to keep God within. And it wasn't an object to be worshipped, it was just an object to be respected. It was a place where God and man could meet. And the Ten Commandments were written on tablets of stone and contained within the Ark. And if Israel followed the Ten Commandments and the rest of the laws that God gave to Moses, God would always be in their presence. So it was basically a box with a fancy top. It was made of acacia wood overlaid in gold and it had four gold rings attached to the feet and long poles that went through the rings in order for the priests to carry the box. The lid was called the mercy seat and on the lid were two gold cherubim, like small children, small angels with wings. And they were facing each other on the top of the box and their wings were spread upwards and covering the seat. And God's presence hovered above the seat between the cherubim when he talked to the priest. It's possible that God used the wings to protect the priest from seeing his glory. Now the priests took the Ark of the Covenant into the tent which David had prepared for it and then sacrifices and offerings of fellowship were made to God and David blessed the people in the name of the Lord and food was distributed to each man and woman in Israel and each received a loaf of bread, a piece of roasted meat or a cake of dates and some raisins. David appointed some of the Levites to lead the worship of the Lord, the God of Israel, in front of the covenant box by singing and praising him. Harps and cymbals were played and trumpets were blown and a song of praise was sang which said, Give thanks to the Lord, proclaim his greatness, tell the nations what he has done. Be glad that we belong to him, let all who worship him rejoice. Go to the Lord for help and worship him continually. Never forget the Lord's covenant which he made to last forever. So if we pray to the Lord to show us the right way to live and we do good things, we are showing him that we are worshipping him and he will be by our side forever. And as children and grown-ups, we can go to the Lord for help when we pray. We can ask for his help and guidance if we feel lost, if we're in trouble, if we feel sad or lonely and he will find a way to help us. All we have to do is to pray and to listen to God and he will show us the way. For we are living in God's kingdom as God made heaven and earth. So we'll finish today with a prayer that you know very well and we'll say the prayer together. But before we do that, you perhaps want to hold your hands together like this or like this. Or you might want to look at the flame of the candle and if you remember the flame represents the Holy Spirit. So you might want to concentrate on that. Or you could just have an image of Jesus in your mind. So if we pray together as we say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So I've really enjoyed relating this story to you today and I hope you have a great day for the rest of the day in the classroom with your teacher and I hope to see you sometime soon. Bye. <laughs>